2 Samuel chapter 16 When David had gone a short distance beyond the summit, there was Ziba, the steward of Mephibosheth, waiting to meet him. He had a string of donkeys saddled and loaded with two hundred loaves of bread, a hundred cakes of raisins, a hundred cakes of figs, and a skin of wine. The king asked Ziba, Why have you brought these? Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and fruit are for the men to eat, and the wine is to refresh those who become exhausted in the wilderness. The king then asked, Where is your master's grandson? Ziba said to him, He is staying in Jerusalem because he thinks, Today the Israelites will restore to me my grandfather's kingdom. Then the king said to Ziba, All that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. I humbly bow, Ziba said. May I find favor in your eyes, my lord the king. As King David approached Behurim, a man from the same clan as Saul's family came out from there. His name was Shimei, the son of Jira, and he cursed as he came out. He pelted David and all the king's officials with stones, though all the troops and the special guard were on David's right and left. As he cursed, Shimei said, Get out, get out, you murderer, you scoundrel! The Lord has repaid you for all the blood you shed in the household of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hands of your son Absalom, you have come to ruin because you are a murderer. Then Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut off his head. But the king said, What does this have to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the lord said to him, Curse David, who can ask, Why do you do this? David then said to Abishai and all his officials, my son, my own flesh and blood, is trying to kill me. How much more than this Benjaminite? Leave him alone, let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look upon my misery and restore to me his covenant blessing instead of his curse today. So David and his men continued along the road, while Shimei was going along the hillside opposite him, cursing as he went and throwing stones at him and showering him with dirt. The king and all the people with him arrived at their destination exhausted, and there he refreshed himself. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the men of Israel came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel was with him. Then Hushai the archite, David's confidant, went to Absalom and said to him, Long live the king! Long live the king! Absalom said to Hushai, So this is the love you show your friend? If he's your friend, why didn't you go with him? Hushai said to Absalom, No, the one chosen by the Lord, by these people and by all the men of Israel, his I will be, and I will remain with him. Furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve the son? Just as I served your father, so I will serve you. Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give us your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel answered, Sleep with your father's concubines, whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself obnoxious to your father, and the hands of everyone with you will be more resolute. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days, the advice Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. That was how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. 2 Samuel chapter 17 Ahithophel said to Absalom, I would choose twelve thousand men and set out tonight in pursuit of David. I would attack him while he is weary and weak. I would strike him with terror, and then all the people with him will flee. I would strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. The death of the man you seek will mean the return of all. All the people will be unharmed. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. But Absalom said, 
summon also Hushai the archite, so that we can hear what he has to say as well. When Hushai came to him, Absalom said, Ahitophel has given this advice. Should we do what he says? If not, give us your opinion. Hushai replied to Absalom, The advice Ahitophel has given is not good this time. You know your father and his men. They're fighters, and as fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Besides, your father is an experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. Even now he is hidden in a cave or some other place. If he should attack your troops first, whoever hears about it will say, There has been a slaughter among the troops who follow Absalom. Then even the bravest soldier, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt with fear, for all Israel knows that your father is a fighter, and that those with him are brave. So I advise you, let all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, be gathered to you, with you yourself leading them into battle. Then we will attack him wherever he may be found, and we will fall on him as dew settles on the ground. Neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. If he withdraws into a city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we will drag it down to the valley until not so much as a pebble is left. Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai the Archite is better than that of Ahitophel. For the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahitophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. Hushai told Zadok and Abiathar the priests, Ahitophel has advised Absalom and the elders of Israel to do such and such, but I have advised them to do so and so. Now send a message at once and tell David, Do not spend the night at the fords in the wilderness. Cross over without fail, or the king and all the people with him will be swallowed up. Jonathan and Ahimahaz were staying at Enrogel. A female servant was to go and inform them, and they were to go and tell King David, for they could not risk being seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So the two of them left at once and went to the house of a man in Bahurim. He had a well in his courtyard, and they climbed down into it. His wife took a covering and spread it out over the opening of the well and scattered corn over it. No one knew anything about it. When Absalom's men came to the woman of the house, they asked, Where are Ahimahaz and Jonathan? The woman answered them, They crossed over the brook. The men searched but found no one, so they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, the two climbed out of the well and went to inform King David. They said to him, Set out and cross the river at once. Ahitophel has advised such and such against you. So David and all the people with him set out and crossed the Jordan. By daybreak, no one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. When Ahitophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. David went to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Absalom had appointed Amasa over the army in place of Joab. Amasa was the son of Jethar, an Ishmaelite who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, the sister of Zeruiah, the mother of Joab. The Israelites and Absalom camped in the land of Gilead. When David came to Mahanaim, Shobai, son of Nahash from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Machir, son of Amiel from Lodibar, and Barzillai the Gilead from Rogelim, brought bedding and bowls and articles of pottery. They also brought wheat and barley, flour and roasted grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, sheep and cheese from cow's milk, for David and his people to eat. For they said, The people have become exhausted and hungry and thirsty in the wilderness. To Samuel, chapter 18. David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. David sent out his troops, a third under the command of Joab, 
a third under Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zeruiah, and a third under Ittai the Gittite. The king told the troops, I myself will surely march out with you. But the men said, You must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. Even if half of us die, they won't care. But you are worth ten thousand of us. It would be better now for you to give us support from the city. The king answered, I will do whatever seems best to you. So the king stood beside the gate while all his men marched out in units of hundreds and of thousands. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king give orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, twenty thousand men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in mid-air while the mule he was riding kept on going. When one of the men saw what had happened, he told Joab, I have just seen Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Joab said to the man who had told him this, What? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have had to give you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, even if a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. In our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, Protect the young man Absalom for my sake. And if I had put my life in jeopardy, and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have kept your distance from me. Joab said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And ten of Joab's armor-bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then Joab sounded the trumpet, and the troops stopped pursuing Israel, for Joab halted them. They took Absalom, threw him into a big pit in the forest, and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. During his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the king's valley as a monument to himself, for he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself, and it is called Absalom's monument to this day. Now Ahimhaz, son of Zadok, said, let me run and take the news to the king that the Lord has vindicated him by delivering him from the hand of his enemies. You are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today, because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Ahimahaz, son of Zadok, again said to Joab, Come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. But Joab replied, My son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring you a reward. He said, Come what may, I want to run. So Joab said, Run. Then Ahimahaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall. As he looked out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, If he is alone, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer. Then the watchman saw another runner, and he called down to the gatekeeper, Look, another man running alone. The king said, he must be bringing good news, too. The watchman said, It seems to me that the first one runs like Ahimahaz, son of Zadok. He's a good man, the king said. He comes with good news. 
Then Ahimaaz called out to the king, All is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, Praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my lord the king. The king asked, Is the young man Absalom safe? Ahimaaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, Stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. John chapter 12 Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come. For the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. 
Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever, so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved human praise more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say, is just what the Father has told me to say. Psalm 112 Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in His commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses and their righteousness endures for ever. Even in darkness light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered for ever. They will have no fear of bad news, their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Proverbs chapter 19 
Better the poor whose way of life is blameless than a fool whose lips are perverse. Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. A false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will not go free. Many curry favor with a ruler, and everyone is the friend of one who gives gifts. The poor are shunned by all their relatives. How much more do their friends avoid them? Though the poor pursue them with pleading, they are nowhere to be found. The one who gets wisdom loves life. The one who cherishes understanding will soon prosper. A false witness will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will perish. It is not fitting for a fool to live in luxury. How much worse for a slave to rule over princes. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offence. A king's rage is like the roar of a lion, but his favour is like dew on the grass. A foolish child is a father's ruin, and a quarrelsome wife is like the constant dripping of a leaky roof. Houses and wealth are inherited from parents, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Laziness brings on deep sleep, and the shiftless go hungry. Whoever keeps commandments keeps their life, but whoever shows contempt for their ways will die. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. A hot-tempered person must pay the penalty. Rescue them, and you will have to do it again. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. What a person desires is unfailing love. Better to be poor than a liar. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He will not even bring it back to his mouth. Flog a mocker and the simple will learn prudence. Rebuke the discerning, and they will gain knowledge. Whoever robs their father and drives out their mother is a child who brings shame and disgrace. Stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. A corrupt witness mocks at justice, and the mouth of the wicked gulps down evil. Penalties are prepared for mockers and beatings for the backs of fools.